forgot to start recording. But I did record in my previous class, you know, the Monday, Wednesday class, and the content should be very much you know, similar in this case. All right, so what we're going to do today is we are going to do adding without using arithmetic operators because you know, that's what we concluded on Tuesday. We concluded on Tuesday that we can uh, implement the R function using arithmetic operations. We concluded that we can uh, finish the C function using arithmetic operations. When I say arithmetic operations, I also include comparison. Greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, uh, the mod operator, okay, uh, addition, subtraction, that sort of stuff. Those are all arithmetic operations. But we want to do without those things, we want to replace everything with logical operation because we know how to implement not and or using the NAND gate, and we know how to implement NAND gates using two P transistors and two N transistors. And the computer is basically all about transistors. So that's kind of the objective of today's lecture, is to finish up you know, how to add, but without using arithmetic operators, and also to introduce the carry ripple adder as a circuit, and I will do it in LogiSim. You know, after class, I can even send you guys you know, the uh, circuit that I have built in today's class. Do we have any questions about you know, what we are about to cover in today's lecture? So it is of paramount importance that we know what is the R function, what is the C function, and how all the digits in the multi-digit addition relate to each other. That is really important. Because otherwise, <clears throat> um, you know, I think we can get lost really quickly in all of this stuff. All right, any questions? No questions? All right, if there are no questions, I am going to start with um, something from before, just a little bit, and then we'll move on you know, into the material for today. So let me switch to the browser. And I'm just going to reshow you know, the C function, you know, which is used for uh, figure out, figuring out whether a carry of one is needed, and also the R function, which is used to figure out you know, the single digit sum when we add two single digits. Now these two functions work for base 10, and, but we already talked about you know, changing these functions to work with base two. It's a five second deal. Change all the tens to twos, and now we have you know, the, the C and the R function working for base two. But the relationship between the digits, you know, like how Q of I is defined using X of I, Y of, y of I, and how the S of I is also defined in terms of Q of I and K of I, all of that does not change. The structure of multi-digit addition is the same regardless of the base. And these two functions are the only places where the base is important because we have you know, greater than or equal to 10, and 10 is the default base you know, when we you know, perform arithmetic operations, and then mod 10 is the same deal. If you want to change these to work with base 2, just change those two 10s into 2s, and now we have the R and the C function working for base 2. So this is a really quick recap of what we have learned already, and then today we're going to build on top of that and say, well, can we change all of these things into logical operations, you know, not and or, okay, so that we can implement addition in transistors? So that's going to be the focus. Are there any questions before we move on? No questions? All right. <clears throat> If you got a chance to read ahead, you know, that's going to be really helpful, even if you cannot understand 100% of what you're reading, um, because, you know, these concepts, you know, really can use a little bit of, um, you know, in laundry term, pre-soak, okay? You know, but we are doing the opposite of pre-soaking, because pre-soaking is to remove something. We want that to sink in, so we are, oh, okay, that's the right term marinate. So we want to marinate before we start cooking, okay? Because we, we want all that flavor, all that knowledge to kind of sink in and seep in as much as possible before we actually cook it and have the chemistry thing to turn it into delicious food. Which is not to say that your brain is delicious. I'm just saying I'm using it as an analogy. We're not zombies. Not yet. <clears throat> all right. So now we're going to do, you know, look at binary thing. 
And instead of just reading my notes, I'm going to switch to the tablet because I cannot read my own notes. I mean, it's so boring. But the notes you know, allows us to look at things from a slightly different perspective. So what I'll do is I'm going to say uh, we have x, we have y as independent variables. And this time, x and y are just you know, some general digits in a particular base, in base 2. So in base 2, which two values can I use per digit? For every digit, there are only two possible values. And what are those? Zeros and ones. Yes, very good. Okay, just like in base 10, it's go from zero to nine because the quantity of 10 requires two digits to represent. With one, only one single digit, we only go from zero to nine. All right, so x can be zero, x can be one. While x is zero, y can be zero, y can be one. While x is one, same thing, y can also be a zero or one. So this approach of writing a truth table should be somewhat familiar at this time because I use truth tables for a lot of stuff. And because inside the computer, everything is binary, in other, in other words, everything is either a zero or a one, this technique of looking at things can be very, very helpful, okay? Um, it's not just limited to people who want to become electrical engineer or ele yeah, electrical engineers or computer engineers, even for programmers, okay, people who work with your know, software and coding, this can still be useful because internal to the computer's memory, everything is still represented in base two, okay? They're all zeros and ones. All right, so now we're going to look at you know, the R of XY, and then we're also going to look at the C of XY. And um, I will try to put this to the side so that we can see the C function definition while looking at the tablet at the same time. Um, oh, there we go, we're moving. So I'm going to move it up to maybe here. So this way on the left-hand side, we can still see the C function so that you can refer to the C function. And then on the right-hand side, I'm going to work out the actual value of R of XY and the C of XY for each row. We just have to remember that we are not dealing with base 10 anymore. We, we are now dealing with base 2. So we place this constant with a 2 and also replace this constant with a 2. Then we'll go ahead and figure out what R should be and what C should be. All right, so we are going to figure out what is R of 0, 0. What do you think? R of 0, 0 is asking what is 0 plus 0 mod 2. What do you think? 0, zero okay. Uh, what about um, R of 0, 1? So R of 0, 1 is 0 plus 1, which is 1. 1 mod 2 is 1 mod 2 is 1, okay? <clears throat> Um, and the other one is symmetric, so it's 1, 2. So now we just have to look at what if x and y are both 1s. So we have 1 plus 1, which is a 2. 2 mod 2 is 0. Very good. Okay, so we got the R column figure out. And now we're going to go to the C column. So now we're looking at, we go back to the row where we have 0 and 0. So what is 0 plus 0 is greater than or equal to 10? <clears throat> a 2, sorry. False. 0 plus 0 is false, which is a 0. So we put a 0 here. Uh, 0 plus 1 is greater than or equal to 2. It's also false. Put a 0 here. Put a 0 here. The only time we put a 1 is on this one. Because 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 is greater than or equal to 2. Remember, we have to change the 10 to a 2. It's true. So if it is true, we return the then value in a ternary expression, and that's why the whole thing just returns a 1. All right, so are there any questions about the truth table at this point? Okay, all right. So this is a good self-test. You know, this little exercise here is a good self-test. Um, if you are following along and you go, like, I, I totally remember what we talked about on Tuesday, great, okay? On the other hand, if you're thinking, I'm not really quite getting this, I don't remember seeing this stuff, um, then you might, need, you might need to spend some time to review the material before class or you know, after class on Tuesday, and then do a little bit more review you know, before today. Because you know, making that connection to previous classes is really important. 
uh, this class is not quote-unquote episodal in the sense that every episode is a standalone thing. This is like one long series where one episode connects to the next episode. But I don't spend a whole lot of time talking about previously, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I don't really spend about you know, maybe two or three minutes each class to do that. All right, so one thing we do notice about this entire table is they are all zeros and ones. Hmm. If they're all zeros and ones, that gives us a pretty good chance of being able to define you know, the uh, R column and the C column using Boolean operators. So we'll start with the easy one, okay? The easy one is the C column here, okay? So we'll focus on that one. Uh, I'll just repeat the table itself, okay? Zero, 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 one, one, zero, and then one, one. And then R of, oops, I said C. Okay, come on, come on, there we go. C of XY is zero, 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 one. All right. And if my objective is to say, I want to do this using a logical operator, can, do I have a logical operator then that can give me exactly the same result as the C of XY? And what would that be? Conjunction and, okay, very good. Because if you just go like, hmm, We'll just do this, okay? C, X, and Y. Uh, X, uh, false and false is false. False and true is false. True and false is also false. True and true is true. Oh, they look exactly the same. So that means in base two, okay? Now, I, I have to emphasize only in base two, using an AND operation will do exactly the same thing that we did before that was using a greater than or equal to an addition and stuff like that. We don't need that stuff anymore. If you're dealing with base two, all you have to do is to make a conjunction, an and, between x and y, and we're done. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so now we move on to the one that is slightly more difficult, which is the r function. So I'm gonna repeat the table again here, okay, so that we can just focus on the discussion of the R function, okay? So in this case, the R of XY in base two will give us zero, one, one, zero. And you know, if I were to ask you, is there a single C logical operator that, that can give us the same result? The answer is no, okay? You don't have to look, you don't have to think because the answer is no, okay? There's no exclusive OR operator, uh, logical exclusive OR in C and C++. There's a bitwise exclusive or operator, but that's not what we're looking for here. So the answer is, okay, you know, it doesn't, we cannot use a single logical operator to replace this. But if I expand my approach and ask, can we write expressions? Can we write a single expression that can be complicated, um, that is in Boolean operators that we know in order to come up with exactly the same result? The answer is yes, okay? In fact, you can make a, a Boolean expression regardless of how, what kind of outcome we have here. Okay, it's just a matter of the complexity of the um, expression. So in this case, we go like, ah, it would be nice to have exclusive OR, but I will write it out first, okay? This is the symbol for exclusive OR. So if exclusive OR would get the job done by itself, okay? So we can have zero, one, one, zero here, if we had, exclusive or as an operator in C and C++. Unfortunately, we do not. And we have not talked about how to use um, NAND gates to make up for an exclusive OR gate. So we go like, okay, but can we replace this with something that we know? Okay, and the answer is, yeah, we can do that too. A little bit cumbersome, but nonetheless, you know, we can get a job done. So that would be the negation of X and Y or x and the negation of y. This is a longer and cumbersome expression, but we'll get the job done. So I'm just gonna pick out one particular row, work it out, and I will leave it to you to work out the other three rows, because I think you should understand how to work with a truth table and how to evaluate an expression like this by hand. So I'm gonna pick, let's say the second row, okay? When x is a zero, y is a one, okay? That's the one example I'm picking. 
So if x is a 0, then not x is going to be a 1. And y is already a 1. So now we have 1 and 1, which is a 1. This is an or on the outside, which means the or is going to be a 1. Because we have one side of the or being a 1 already, I can make a conclusion right away and say that the entire disjunction, the entire or, is going to be a 1. Okay, so I'm just working out this one. I want you guys to actually spend some time, maybe after class, to work out all of the other rows. But I can tell you, if you do work out the other rows, they will turn out to be like this. You go like, huh, okay. So that means you know, that kind of long ish you know, expression will do the trick for r of xy, which is great. Because what that is saying is, instead of having an addition, which is an arithmetic operation, and a division that is hidden inside the mod operation. Division is nasty, okay? Division is a complicated operation. Um, many processors can now do division in hardware, but it is still complicated, okay? So we want to avoid the use of, of division as much as possible. So instead of doing this, we can now just do this. I mean, it looks uglier, but it's actually a whole lot faster to evaluate. And the best part is, we can now build circuits to do it. So are there any questions about the truth table approach here, where we have now established a, we have established logical expressions that can replace the original arithmetic expressions? So are there any questions about th that aspect? All right, no questions? Okay, so now that we know everything can be done using logical operators, and logical operators is really the same thing as a logical gate, okay, as a logic gate. The only difference is one is in hardware, and we slap it into Logisim, and it looks a little funny, and then the other one is more familiar because we type it up as text, but they do the same thing. An AND gate is an AND operator. A OR gate is an OR operator. And then a NOT gate is a NOT operator. It's just that one is kind of more visual, more graphical. The other one is in text. All right. So if this is OK, we're going to build some circuits. OK, we're going to start up Logisim, and it will build circuits in order to demonstrate and actually to get a 3-bit by 3-bit adder to work. All right. So let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> I'm just looking to see if I still have a Logisim uh, started up, and the answer is no, I do not. That's okay. We'll go ahead and start one up right now. Um, that should do it. So it's there. We go. All right. So I'm moving Logisim into the onto the projector. <clears throat> All right, so now we have a clean slate. The first thing we need to do is to say, hmm, I'm going to build what we call a half adder. Okay, A half adder is really just a component that can be reused multiple times. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a function in, in order to do something you know, repeatedly in order, in, instead of copy and pasting, we just say, okay, we'll make a function out of this thing here and we'll just call this function from multiple places. That's basically what we're building here. It's called a half adder. So we go to project, add circuit, half adder, okay. And a half adder has two inputs, okay. So we'll kind of put some inputs here and then we'll put some outputs over here on the other side, like so. And every time we are building something, whether you're building a program or building a circuit, you probably want to know what is what are incoming and what are the outputs of that thing. So we'll go ahead and say the input has the variable u and v. Okay, they're just names of variables so that we can we can refer to those when we have to document the output. So this output here, I'm just going to call this you know, C of u v. You know, in other words, whatever circuit I built inside is going to send the output. You know, this is going to be the carry of digit u plus digit v, and this one here is the r of u v. Okay, do we have any questions about the interface into this circuit? In other words, 
This defines what we are going to do, okay, what the circuit is going to do. It will do two things, okay, in parallel. It's going to compute the carry and also to compute the single sum, uh, single digit sum of adding digit U and digit V. That's all it's going to do. Are we doing okay so far? I'm just stating the objective of the circuit. I haven't built it yet. So now we're going to go ahead and build the circuit. Uh, we'll do the easy one first, okay, just so that you know, it's, it's a gentler uh, learning curve. So this is an AND gate. We slap an AND gate here. We have to change the size, change the number of inputs, like so. But the carry is really just a conjunction, an AND, between the you know, U and the V. So I'm going to put this one, oh, okay, probably be better to take a turn here and then make a straight line to here. And then the other one is just V. So V goes into the other input of the AND gate. And I'm done with one of the outputs. Are we doing okay so far with this? And then the next thing we want to do is to deal with the R. So the R, okay, I will just kind of write the comments here. This way, you know, be, I can remind you what we are, what we want to do. So R of UV is the negation of U and V or U and the negation of V. So I'm typing this here just so that as a reminder, okay, we can just look at the screen and we don't have to flip pages to go back and forth. All right, so what do we need to do? Well, it looks like we're going to need an OR gate, but that's going to be the last gate, okay, before we get to the output. That's okay. We can always you know, do things in that particular order. So once again, you'll change it to narrow, limit the input to two, and the OR is the last operation, so it's going to be right next to the output pin because you know, this is the last operation. It is the outermost operation in the expression. The left-hand side and the right-hand side of the OR both need an AND operation. So I'm just going to be lazy here and pick out this AND gate and say, eh, let's make some copy of this. Okay, because this way I don't have to reintroduce um, the AND gate and then change the sizes and all that stuff. So I'll put one here, and then we'll put another one. Okay. Uh, grab it, grab it, come on. There we go. All right, so the two AND gates you know, would have their output being the input connected to the input of the OR gate. So now the question is, what do we connect to the AND gate? So inside the first end, I'll say this is the top one, we have to negate U first, and then we introduce V here. So when you go to the gates, you can actually see that there is a gate called the NOT gate right here. So the NOT gate does exactly what the name suggests. It would negate the input. The output is the negation of the input. So we can do it that way. But it's going to be complicated. The design will have a lot of stuff in it. So instead of doing that, we'll go back to the AND gate and say, hmm, what can an AND gate do? So the way we figure out what an AND gate can do is to look at this stuff here, okay? And some of these we already know, we are familiar with, and then there are a few, two of those is something that we haven't really talked about. So we'll go with, uh, we'll start from the beginning. Facing you know, controls the rotation of the gate, make it look nice, okay? The orientation can make it look nicer. Uh, data bits is one because you know, we're dealing with only one single digit at a time at this point. So you know, one for data bits is correct. Uh, the gate size is narrow because, hey, we only need two input pins. Making it too large, it does, doesn't look good. Okay? It doesn't change the functionality per se, but it just changes how it looks in that case. Uh, we have two inputs because you know, with a regular AND expression, you have the left-hand side and then you have the right-hand side. So there are two inputs to you know, present to the gate in order to do the computation. So two, input, you know, two inputs is correct. Uh, the output value is zero or one, which is fine, okay? Um, we don't have a label, okay? That's why we don't need a label, and so the label font is not relevant to us either. Whew, all the way to the bottom here, okay? So now we say, huh, we can actually negate the top input before it actually operates on the end. So when I do this, okay, if you look at the picture, there's a little bubble now. 
So in the logic diagram, in the logic gate circuit diagram, a bubble typically means negation. Now, when was the last time we saw a bubble making a difference in the design of a circuit? The P transistors versus the N transistors. The N transistors are the ones without the bubble, and then the P transistors are the ones that are with the bubble. Why? Well, if you think about an N transistor as a switch, okay, when the gate is a one, the switch is on, it connects the circuit. That's what most people think it should work, right? You know, because you're asserting the gate is being quote unquote asserted because it has a value of one and it turns on. Okay, most people look at that as positive logic. In other words, a one means do it. But the P transistor is the opposite. If you look up a P transistor, it turns on when the gate is a zero. In other words, we can look at it as a negated input, which means, hey, if the input is not asserted, okay, when the gate is not asserted, the switch is actually on. And therefore, there's a bubble to highlight it, to basically say, this one is special, okay? You know, if you want to turn it on, give it a zero, not a one. So in this case, you know, we have a bubble here, and then with the bottom one, we're gonna put the bubble at the bottom. Yes, you, know, you don't have to do it that way, but this way the circuit looks a little bit nicer. Okay, now we just have to make the connections now. So we have U going to the negated input here, and then U going to the unnegated input here. And then V, oops, is, oh, that is correct. Okay, so then V goes to the other input. It is not negated on the top end gate, and it is negated at the bottom end gate. All right, so I claim that we are done here. Okay, we have now computed the C of UV using a single end gate, and then now we have computed the R of UV using a slightly more complicated you know, sub-circuit. Are there any questions about the diagram at this point? Yep, go ahead. What is it called a half adding? Well, because it, it does a half-ass job of adding. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll make it very clear why this is called a half-adder. Because you know, for each column of adding, this thing can relate the x and the y to the q. It can relate the q, k to the sum. And it does a half-ass job with the carry to the next digit. Okay, that's basically why it's called a half adder because we need two of these to make a full adder. All right, so let me uh, just you know, let's take a short break here you know, because I want to take row. So let me switch to the row taking thing. Okay, I got it prepared already today. It's already here. Let me unhide it first so that you can get into it. And once you get into it, the passcode is what password? I like these passwords because when people ask me, so what is the password? What password? Or well, something like, I can't remember. What do you mean by you can't remember? I cannot remember. The password is I cannot remember. <laughs> We do have a lab today. The lab today is has a lot of, well, I wouldn't say a lot of, it has some math in it. The math is not complicated. It's not calculus, it's not linear algebra, it's not differential equation. It is mostly arithmetic, okay? Addition, subtraction, mod, that sort of stuff. But you do have to understand the class material in order to answer those questions. So it's a good self-assessment of how familiar you are with the concepts. Uh, yesterday, I got one person who finished it in four minutes, and they just poof, walked out. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, if you're if that person is familiar with the concept, and you know, that's not a problem. All right, so are we good with uh, the road taking activity? Does anyone need more time with road taking? Nope, you're all good here. All right, so now we go back to the circuit. And not this one, this one here. There we go. All right, so we're building this circuit, and now we go switch to the appearance because I really kind of need to document what these pins are. So I'm going to use the text tool here, 
uh, one is u, one is v, and then one is c of u v. Um, hold on a second. Let me finish this first. So uh, zooming in is this tool here. Um, you know, you can increase the zoom. You can decrease the zoom. So now I just have to move those things around. This is typically how I do things. You know, I just slap all the text label, you know, and then just you know, use my, and then I position these things to the right places. Okay, so U goes here, and then C is the top one, and R is the bottom one. Now, if I cannot remember which one is which one, uh, the trick is to kind of just click on the pin itself, and then you will see a picture in picture at the lower right hand side. And that will highlight the actual pin in the circuit itself. So this way, you know, if I do forget, okay, but I cannot remember which one is which one, there's always a way to go back to find it. All right, so the half, you know, half adder is done. Now it's time to move on to the full adder. So um, let me go back to add circuit. And this time we're adding a full adder. So the full adder, that is the, the most important part is to define the input. So the input of a full adder has three input pins. So one, two, and three. It has two outputs. So we got one and two. All right. And the labeling of these pins is very important because you know, this way we can actually map the circuit to the concepts that we have understood. So the first pin is going to be X of I. In other words, it is one single bit or one single digit coming from one of the two numbers that I want to add. The second one, as you probably would expect, is Y of I because it is one single bit of the same position as the X uh, of the other number that is part of the addition. And then this one here is K of I, <clears throat> which is you know, basically the... Um, it's computed based on the previous columns, and that's why to this particular digit is an input. The output would have you know, S of I, which is you know, one bit of the sum. This is a part of the actual answer that I need. And then the other one is K of I plus one. I cannot do subscript, you know, so you can kind of imagine I plus one, the entire thing is in the subscript. All right, so at this point, okay, I'm really testing to see if you remember how the digits relate to each other. And it doesn't really have anything at this point to do with base two yet, okay? So how many half adders do you think I need for a full adder? I spoke of that already, but just from the name of the circuitry, we need two halves to make a full, okay? So I'll just go ahead and slap two of the half adders here, okay? So there we go, we got two half adders. And then I will ask you, hmm, how do we make use of these two half adders to get the output that I want? And someone is gonna say, but Tex, aren't you forgetting the Q of I in this picture? Well, the Q of I is computed using the X and Y. And how are the Q of I's related to the X I and the Y I? Hmm? Sorry? The sum. Okay, but using just things in this picture here, can we just go like, oh, okay, I know how to get to the Q because we have X, we have Y, and then we have ways to compute the C and the R. So how does Q of I relate to X of I and Y of I? It is one of the outputs of the half adder. Okay, very good. So we are just going to say, okay, so from what you just described, that means you know, we need X and Y going to the inputs of the half adder, like so. And then one of the output should be the Q of I. Which one? Hmm? The R of, yeah, the, the R of UV is our Q of I. Okay, so this one here is our Q of I. Um, okay, how do we compute the sum? How does S of I relate to Q of I and K of I? The 
sum, which in this case, you know, uh, what function do we use? Do we use the C function or the R function? It's the R function, very good. So what he's saying is S of I is R of Q of I and K of I, okay? So this is the quick test, right? You know, this is the quick assessment of are you digesting things from the previous three lectures? Because you know, all of this were introduced already in the pre previous three lectures. Um, if this sounds familiar, but you're not recalling like you know, when I asked you, well, that's probably okay at this point, okay? Just the fact that you say, yeah, that sounds familiar. I think it'd be, I remember that we talked about this, okay? And you know where to find it, that's good. On the other hand, if somebody says, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about, I would be concerned, okay? You know, and I think in that case, uh, the RAD program would definitely be helpful, okay? Okay, so that means, you know, the this R here is going to this S of I over here. And in order to get this output, once again, you know, S of I is the R of the Q of I, which is this Y here, and the K of I. So that means, oh, okay, so I just have to hook up this K of I as one of the inputs here, and then take this, which is basically Q of I at this point, into the other input, like so. Now we have S of I done. And then you look at this and go like, hmm, but, 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 but something is still missing. Look at this, okay? Look at K of I plus one and the C of UV from, you know, X, I, Y, I. Basically, this is C, of, okay, let me put here. This is C of X, I, Y, I. This is the C of um, uh, Q, I, K, I. How are we supposed to use those two dangling wires in order to figure out k of i plus 1. In other words, I'm asking for the equation that says k of i plus 1 equals to blah, 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 blah. What is that blah, 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 blah? R of q i k i. R, no, 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 that's not it. Okay. That's okay, not a problem. I mean, you, you know where to look, okay, that's fine. K of I plus 1 is? C of X I Y I plus K I. Plus C of Q I K I. Okay? All right. So now we have a problem. Because, you know, let me just write here what we are about to do. And then we go like, but we cannot do it yet. Because what we have here is K of, you know, okay, I'm going to use brackets to basically indicate a, a subscript. So k of i plus 1, k of i plus 1, uh, come on, i plus 1 is c of um, x of i, y of i, plus uh, c of um, q of i, k of i. We have, we have looked at this equation multiple times already, okay, so... It's important, you know, that this becomes, this is knowledge, okay? This thing here needs no, you know, this is just knowledge, okay? Because it, it's a definition that we have already talked about multiple times. So that means, you know, we really have to remember, you know, to kind of study and review so that it is not, should it should be, it should not be a surprise anymore, okay? It should be like, yep, I know that, I got it, okay? Okay, but the problem is we have an arithmetic operation here. I got the entire C of X, I, Y, I as this Y already. I got the entire C of Q, I, K, I as this Y over here. But we have a plus here, which is not a logical operator. Darn it. <laughs> so now, what do we have to do? We have to go find a logical a way to do this using just logic gates. That doesn't sound right, right? Because all we're trying to do is to implement an adder and in order to implement an adder, I need to implement an adder. Do you see a problem with that logic? It's, it's circular, okay? It's a chicken and egg kind of thing. But we got a, we got a few tricks, you know, in, you know, that we can use. So let me switch back to the tablet. And I'll turn a new page. 
actually I can move it to slightly to the left first and then we'll turn a new page. So let me do that. Okay, move this one to here. There we go. All right, so now we turn the new page and then we look at truth table again. So we look at X, uh, X and Y. Okay, let's let's use just U and V because I don't want to use you know, the uh, the row names. So we have U and V here. Same thing. U is a single digit in binary. V is also a single digit in binary, and they are independent. So one does not depend on the other. And then we have U plus V. Okay. So this is not strictly a truth table because we have zero, one, one, and then we have a two here. Is that okay so far? I'm just mapping out, you know, considering all the possible values of u and v, um, what are the results of u plus v? Okay, this is strictly just an addition. Do I like it? Okay, that's that's kind of cool. And then we're gonna look at the, the the closest operator, the closest logical operator that can approximate your addition. Not entirely, it, it's not exactly the same, but it gets us pretty close, okay? So when you look at the logical OR of U and V, then we get 0, 1, 1, 1. Huh, that got us pretty close, okay? Not exactly, but really close. So what this means is, if I can guarantee the last row would never happen, in other words, if I can guarantee that U and V cannot be once at the same time, then I can just use logical OR instead of addition. Does that make sense? Because the last row is the only difference between the two operators. So if the situation of U and V being once at the same time will never happen, then I go like, well, then it doesn't make a difference. I can use logical or instead of addition. So that's what we want to do, okay? And now the question is, uh, but are you really sure this is going to work? So I'm going to give you guys an even longer truth table so that we can figure out you know, whether the last row, this situation, will happen or not. So now we take a look at, um, we look at um, the three inputs into the whole thing. So we got x of i, we got y of i, we also got k of i as the inputs, and then we have q of i not as an input, it is not an independent variable, we'll compute q of i from the uh, x and y. So x now can be false, 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 true, 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 true. Y can be false, false, true, true, false, false, true, true. Ki can be false, true, false, true, false, true, false, true. The reason why k of i is considered an independent variable is because k of i is determined by the columns to the right-hand side. And as a result, from the current column's perspective, I really have no control over whether the k of i is a one or zero. So it is considered an independent variable. But we already know how q of i is defined, right? Because q of i is r of x i y i. If you say tag, I think this is like the fifth time you mentioned it today, and probably the fifteenth time you mentioned it, you know, you know, in the entire semester. Great. Okay, that means you're paying attention and you remember the definitions. The definitions are very important, okay? Because this definition here is in the module. We have also talked about it in class as well, okay? So sometimes feeling bored because you know the material already and I'm just repeating the same material over and over again, it's a good sign, okay? How many of you are feeling bored? This is like the, the nth time you talk about this. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right, so Q of I is just the R of X, I, Y, I, which we know is now just the exclusive OR between those two. So this is going to be a zero, this is going to be a zero, this is going to be a one, one, and then we have one, one, and then we have zero and zero again. I mean, the way you compute Q of I, you don't have to use the exclusive OR. You can just use the original equation or the original function in C and go through all the, the mod operator and stuff like that. You know, it will give you the same result, okay? All right, so now what do we do? Now we look at the C of X, I, Y, I. 
which is just a conjunction this time. So we have false, 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 true, true. And then we look at C of Q, I, K, I. And that's going to be false, 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 false. Oop. Okay, I have to make sure I'm looking at the right column. Nope, I got the last one wrong. Okay, there we go. This is a true. And this is a false. This is a true. That's a false. And that's also a false. Whew. Okay. I'm just working out the um, K of I plus one thing, you know, step by step. So now I look at K of I plus one. Okay, this is K of I plus one. And the equation to do k of i plus 1 has been mentioned at least twice today, so I'm not going to do that. It is basically e the addition between um, the last two columns is the addition between c of x i y i and c of q i k i. Just add up those two numbers, right? So I can add numbers, okay? 0 plus 0 is a 0. 0 plus 0 is a 0. 0 plus 0 is a 0. 0 plus 1 is a 1. 0 plus 0 is a 0. 0 plus 1 is a 1, 1 plus 0 is a 1, 1 plus 0 is a 1. Okay. What is this binding? So now it's time to kind of retract our steps and ask, why are we doing this? How does this truth table, the longer one, has anything to do with the truth table on top of it. What is the relationship between these two truth tables? It never happens. It never happened. Because when you look at um, these two, basically this is my U column and this is my V column on top. And the only time I'm in trouble is when they are both ones. But that never happens here. Neither is a one, neither is a one, neither is a one, one is a one, neither is a one, one is a one, one is a one, one is a one. They never become one at the same time. So that means, that means I don't have to worry about this anymore. Is this a mathematical proof? The answer is yes. Is it a concise and human kind of proof? Not so much, okay? But do we know for sure that you know, the two you know, Cs, you know, C of X, I, Y, I, and the C of Q, I, K, I cannot be once at the same time? Yes, we are 100% sure. Why? Because we have looked at every single case of X, X, I, Y, I, and K, I, and we have concluded that none of those cases can generate the uh, result of C of X, I, Y, I, and the C of Q, I, K, I, both being ones. So this is a concrete proof, okay? But it is still a proof that this row over here cannot possibly happen. Okay, so now we backtrack one more time, okay? We backtrack one more time and ask, and why is that important? Why is the top truth table important? Why is it important to cross out the last row and go like, phew, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Why is that important? So you don't need another exactly. So we can use a or instead of an arithmetic addition. Okay. Very good. And now we backtrack one more step. This is how, you know, um, this is the way that I learn, okay? You know, when I learn, I drill into details and then I back up, back up, back up, and then drill some more and then back up. And so it's, it's, a, it's a recursive traversal. I know most of you have not taken 430 or 440, but it is like that, okay? And um, so it's important to keep track of all that stuff. Write down notes, you know, especially using a nested bulleted list is really important. Okay, so that means you know this thing here, which is representing C of X I Y I, and this thing here, which is representing Q, uh, C of Q I K I, 
I can now use both of these to come up with Q of i plus 1 using an OR gate. That is what we are trying to do. So we now come back to the whole reason why we went through those truth tables and make use of our conclusion and say, we don't need an add here. We just need an OR here, which is nice because now I can go like, woohoo, everything can now be done using transistors. Make it look nice like that. Woohoo! I have just related all the digits with each other using only logic gates, which means I can now do addition using transistors. No one seemed to be very excited about this. <laughs> I mean, this is a this is this is really important. This is one of those moments where you go like, "Oh, so that's how it's done in a computer." I mean, okay. This class used to be all about actual just using assembly language to do programs, and later on they changed it so that it has to include computer architecture, which basically is asking, "What is inside the processor? How does it, how does the processor get things done?" And this is one of those things where, oh, so this is how we get addition done. Not entirely, this is just adding one single digit, but we just have to stack these things to do multi-digit addition, which is what we're going to do next. But I'm, I want to ask to see if there are any questions, because if we do have questions at this point, we should probably clear up all everything before we move forward to talk about multi-digit addition using the full adders. Okay, I'll say one more thing. Okay, so when you're reviewing this stuff here, um, this picture is relating all the digits again. Okay, this is a different way of relating the digits. I remember maybe last Thursday or so, I gave you uh, a bunch of equations. Okay, I said your Q of i is R of X i Y i, S of i is R of Q i K i, and then K of i plus 1 is C of X i Y i plus uh, C of QIKI. Okay, those are the three equations. All three equations are here in this picture. It's just represented slightly differently. So, understanding the different, you know, the similarity, you know, what information is being conveyed but in different format is also important. Okay, because now you can see that, oh, so it's really conveying exactly the same thing, except this time it is a circuit. Everything can be done inside a computer using transistors. All right, so now we can uh, switch to the uh, appearance mode, and I need to annotate a few things, because if I don't, I will forget which one is which one. So xi, yi, ki, ki plus 1, and then s of i. There we go. We just have to move things around a little bit here. So x of i is this thing, y of i goes over here, k of i is the third input, we'll stash it here, k of i plus 1 is I think the top one, see I cannot remember my own circuit, but that's okay because I can cheat, I can just click here and go like, yep, that is k of i plus 1, okay, so I remember it correctly, because this is the output of the OR, and then S of i, which is i, the i bit i of the sum, goes here. Okay, great. So now I have one more abstraction. You know, actually, this is not, well, it is an abstraction, but it's made out of your know, um, smaller components that we have talked about. So now we switch back to main, and we go like, okay, so let's go ahead and implement a 3-bit by 3-bit adder and, you know, and see if that works. So now we have this pin here is X and it's 3 bit wide because we have a 3 bit number here. And then we are going to duplicate this for Y because Y is also going to be 3 bit wide. Oops. There we go. I'm, I'm going to leave quite a bit of space between because we need a lot of splitters in this design. 
And then we have one single bit, which is representing k0. So k0 is a single bit, okay? We can call this k in or k input. And then as the output, we have the sum as an output. So this is s. And then we also have another output pin, which is k out or carry out. So k out goes here. And then the sum bit needs to be three bit wide because you know, the width of x and y should also be the same as the width of the sum. All right. So now it's time to you know, put in all those you know, full adders. One full adder is responsible for adding the addition for one single digit. So how many full adders do you think we need here? Three of them. Yes. Okay. So we're going to slap three of those things here. So we go to full adder. You know, here's one. Duplicate. Second one. And here's our third one. There we go. Okay. Okay, so now we have a little bit of an issue because x is a three-bit thing, but x of i is a single bit of, um, you know, of x. So what do we need? A splitter, okay? And, okay, so we'll go ahead and go to wiring and pull out a single splitter, and then we'll just go ahead and you know, replicate it when, we, when it's time to do it. Okay. So can someone tell me what is the bit width that we need for this particular splitter? In other words, how many bits are we trying to connect to on the merged end of the splitter? Three of them? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we say we need three here. Okay. Go up to three. What about fan out? Fan out is basically asking how many split end do we need? We need, okay, we got two, we got four, and they're both incorrect. <laughs> what is left? Three of them, yes, because we need to get x0, x1, x2 as individual digits. So we need the fan out to be three. Oh, not six. Scroll and then click. There we go. So now we can say, okay, let's pull this one over here, and now we can break up x into x0, x1, x2, and then we can now duplicate this, do the same thing with y, okay, so we can now split out uh, y0, y1, y2, and then on the other side, we need a merger, which is basically a splitter, you just look at it in a slightly different way, so we need one more copy of this, except this time we want to Rotate it 180 degrees, like so, and that will connect to the sum, like so. So this is S0, this is S1, and this is S2. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to change the label of K in. We'll just call this K0 so it's less confusing. So this is actually just K0, and the K out in this case is K3. So this is this is this makes it less confusing. You know, makes it easier to explain and also to make the connections. So if I were to just leave you alone and make all the connections, you know, can you do that? Now, maybe not yet. Okay, I'll give you three more clues. Then you go like, oh, okay, I know how to do this. So the three more clues I'm going to give you is to say this is when i equals to zero. And I'm not sure whether I have enough space to do this, but let's see. This is when i equals to 1, and this is when i equals to 2. Because they all say, you know, x, i, y, i, k, i, you know, it's like, what, what, which i are we talking about? So now it is quite explicit which, what, val what value of i we are talking about in all three cases. So with this, as an additional clue, can we make the connections? Okay, all right. So let's let's hook up the X first, okay? So where do you think this wire goes to? Which pin of uh, X equals, I equals to zero, I equal one, or I equal to two? Where, where should it go? In this entire picture, okay? Because now that we know each full adder handles one particular case for I, which one handles X zero? Which one requires X zero as an input? The top one, okay, very good. 
<clears throat> and it goes to xi of this chip here, because you know, when i equals to zero, this is my x zero. This is also x zero because it is the split end of you know, x. All right, so that means x one just kind of goes to the next one down here, right? And then x two goes to the bottom one. Are we good so far? All right. So y is kind of similar. You know, there's not a whole lot of uh, differences between those two. So you know, y zero goes to y i when i equals to zero. Y one goes to y i when i equals to one. And then y two goes to yi when i equals to 2. There we go. Uh, I think k0 is pretty clear where it should go, right? Yeah, because k0 should go to k of i when i equals to 0. So it's going to go here. All right, so we got all the inputs almost, you know, of the full adders, you know, now done. Um, we'll do the easy one first. We'll do the sum bits. So where do you think this goes? This is S of I when I equal to zero. What is the easy way to say that? It's S zero. So where is S zero as an output? It's bit zero of the splitter that connects to S. So this is S zero and it connects to bit zero of the splitter that merges into the sum. So that mean, means this one is bit one of the sum, and this is bit two of the sum. Okay, cool. Uh, where do you think this one goes? Now, what, what does it mean is k of i plus one when i equals two? Okay, wait. When i is 2, i plus 1 is 3. So we actually are looking at k3. Where do you think k3 goes? It goes to the output pin that is also labeled k of 3. Okay. So there you go. So this goes just here, right here. Okay. Yes, I do have a red wire, but that's okay because you know, the circuit is not done yet. So now we are left with k of i plus 1 when i equals to 0, um, k of i when i equals to 1, k of i plus 1 when i equals to 1, and then uh, k of i when i equals to 2. Um, yes, go ahead. It would go into the k of one Yep, yep. So this is, this wire connects, this is corresponding to k of 1, because this is k of i plus 1 and when i equals to 0. 0 plus 1 is 1, so this is actually just k of 1. So what is this one here? This is k of well, this is k of i when i equals to 1. So that is also k of 1. k of 1 connecting to k of 1 seems to make sense. Okay? So it's not going to look very nice because we're going to have some crossover wires, but that's okay. That's why in the first class I talked about crossing over first. So this one is going to do the same thing, okay? Yeah, once again, it looks a little bit ugly. So it goes here, and it wraps around, and it goes to the bottom, sticks into here. Now we have a 3-bit by 3-bit adder. How do we know it works? Well, it's already working right now. It's telling us that 0 plus 0, with k0 being a 0, has a sum of 0, and the K3 also be a zero. Does that sound about right to you? I hope so. What about two plus three? How do we how do we how do we test the case of two plus three using using this circuit? Well, we cannot just specify two over here and three over here because those are base ten digits. So what does two look like as a binary number? We know how to do base conversion like that. Yep. So can you spell that out? One zero. One zero. Very good. 
But we do need a leading zero because we need three bits. So it's zero, one, zero, S2, okay? So now we just need the middle one here as a one and change to the poke tool and make this a one. What about three? You know, what we know as three, you know, what does that look like as a binary number? Okay. Zero, one, one. Zero, one, one, because we have one, one, and one, two, add up to a three. So it's zero, one, one. So we stash it over here. And then the result is one, zero, one. One, zero, one in base two means we have one of one, zero of two, and then one of four. So four plus one is five. We've got the result that we want. Now, what is what may be a little confusing is why do we have this K zero here as an input pin? That allows us to daisy chain you know, this particular design so I can make a six bit adder using two three bit adders. Once I have a six bit adder, I can make a 12 bit adder using two six bit adders because basically what we're going to do if I need to kind of stack the design is to hook up K3 to K0 and then you know, kind of stack it on like that. So K3 of an earlier adder will connect to K0 of a later of the next adder. So this allows me to kind of daisy chain and make longer you know, um, adders as I need to uh, implement the longer adders. Are we good so far? Okay, so I will save the design and then send it to you so that you have you know, the, the reference design. Let me save it first before I forget. So save, and I have to save it to my actual folder. Okay, so stash it here, and I'm just going to call this uh, carry ripple adder. So you go like, oh, okay, so we are done with this entire module. Oh, no, not even close, not even close. Why not? Well, if you look at this adder, the one thing that is... That is, that's, that's the problem, is I can't really figure out you know, K3 until K2 is done, okay? until I know what K2 is. But I cannot figure out K2 until I know what K1 is supposed to be. So that means I have a linear dependency. K of I plus 1 depends on K of I. So what that means is using this particular design, a 64-bit adder will take twice the time of a 32-bit adder, a 32-bit adder will take twice the time of a 16-bit adder, and so on. Okay. Now, if everybody is doing it like this, and this is the only way to implement an adder, we go like, okay, that's just live. Okay, deal with it. Unfortunately, that is not the case. There are ways to make it constant time. Instead of making this, you know, linear to the number of bits, there's a trick to make it into a constant time adder. In other words, you can make an adder that's 128 bit. It will take the same, in theory, the same amount of time as a 4 bit adder, or as a 2 bit adder, or as a 1 bit adder. It does not matter how wide your adder is. You go like, how can that be done? That is something that we will talk about next Tuesday because we don't get Tuesday off. Okay, the Monday Wednesday class get, got Monday off. It's really sad. And you guys go like. But I want my, my vacation, my holiday too. Trust me, you don't want it. Not in my classes. So, because in my classes, you know, things are usually really packed. Losing one day is a big deal. It's not, it's not nice to lose one day. All right, so getting back to the notes here. We have basically just covered everything all the way, but excluding section six. And from the thumb bar, you know, thumbnail on the right-hand side here, you can see that we are not quite done. We are only about one third done. Because there is a technique called a carry look ahead adder. And that technique allows us to implement constant time adder, regardless of how many bits we are trying to add. And it does have some math involved in it. Um, there are some Boolean algebra derivation that we'll kind of quickly go over. This is class is not about Boolean algebra, so I will just kind of skim through that a little bit. But how we utilize that is not going to be something that I can skim over, which basically allows us to generalize and create circuits that can do constant time adding regardless of how many bits we are adding. 
So it's kind of magical in the sense, you know, but at the same time, once you look at the math of it, it's like, oh, okay, we are just complicating the whole thing. We are buying time with silicon, basically. That's what, what we're doing. We're complicating the design quite a bit, but what we're gaining is a constant time computation. Okay, so that's what we would do. That's what we'll be doing next Tuesday. And to get through this stuff here, you really need to have a good knowledge you know, uh, of what we have already talked about. So that's going to be next week, um, which means you know over the weekend you probably want to do some reviews just to make sure that everything that we have already talked about everything sinks in. Okay, before we start to talk about the optimization of an adder. All right, so now we can move back to the lab for today. I made a mistake, but I fixed it already for this class, so you guys are not seeing that mistake. So it should be good to go, and it is called um, lab addition. It just you know, kind of makes use of the definitions that we have been talking about in today's class, but it's not applicable to base two. Um, it's you know, using some of the other bases. So that's going to be your lab, and the due time is right before noon. And I will show you the access code in just a moment. All right, so the settings, the access code is, what is that? Why would I choose that as the access code? If the answer is, I have no idea, Taki, why you would use these random letters, I go, I, I will start to worry. Yes, go ahead. Yep, yep. These are the names of the letters you know, corresponding to the roles that we have been talking about since Tuesday or last Thursday. I cannot remember. I cannot remember. But it should be starting to sink in now. Okay, you the the row names of X, Y, Q, K, this is Q, and S. So that's the access code. And do, 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 do. I think that's it. Okay. So you guys can start right now once I as soon as I unhide it. Or you can take a short break, get something to drink, and then come back and start on it. You should be able to see it now. If you refresh re refresh your browser, you should be able to start the lab now. I'm gonna turn off the screen, roll up all the um, uh, the screens, and then you can see. The whiteboard. All right. Anything else before I turn off the recorder? Because everything up to this point is being recorded, which is nice because now you can use it for review purposes. Um, I will also send to you through announcements the Logisim circuit that I just built, and I really think that you know it's a good idea to look at that one and annotate it. Okay, you can print it out you know, on the piece of paper and then start to add your own annotation. Or you can just use the text tool and add your own comment inside the circuit. Uh, but I think it is probably a, um, a useful thing for you to look into. So I'm just going to say this is a carry ripple adder. Okay, see attached. And I have to navigate to find it. It's in my documents. CISP pretend. I don't think I put it there. I think I put it in here. There we go. And finish. All right, so I just sent you the uh, circuit that I built today using announcement. So I would say, you know, go check your announcements, you know, download the circuit, open it up in Logisim. And then just make sure that you understand how the whole thing works. Oop. Okay. Um, any questions before I stop the recorder and upload the recording? Nope. Okay. All right. So we will go ahead and do that. <laughs>